I'm Liz Gulliver, and I have an 18-month-old son and a two-month-old daughter. I'm Dedon Bruner, and I have a nine-year-old daughter. I'm Callan Blunt Fleming, and I have a three-and-a-half-year-old daughter and a 10-month-old son. My name is Meaty Bartnelli, and I have a 14-year-old son. Go for it, Dedon. You're up first. So we've been having a conversation on parenting, particularly as it relates... No. <laughs> We've been having a conversation on community, culture. Nope. <laughs> The pandemic has taken away everything that we, ah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, here we go. So we've been having this conversation. A completely raw, candid conversation across four different working parents. And it feels really important to have this conversation right now. Particularly during this pandemic. This is an ideal opportunity to rethink how we parent. And how we empower parents through culture, community, and our companies culture, community, and definitely with inside our companies. So let's talk about how we all know each other and why we are doing this conversation together. So Callan and I know each other because she and I both founded companies to support working parents. And we've done several panels together, collaborated together, and we first synced up to work on this together. And I was thrilled to collaborate with Dedon earlier this year, right as the pandemic set in on a couple of panels on a conversation for the International Day of Purpose and really found all of his reflections about fatherhood and how he wants to create his parenting to be really powerful. And so we decided to work together. And she may not know it, but for about the last year, I've been following Meaty online because she's been chronicling um, her experience as a nurse in the in, during the coronavirus pandemic. And I, I thought, what better what better addition to the team than someone who's on the front line? Um, and it's only a bonus that that we go back to our days at Howard. Exactly, and I'm just grateful to be added to the team as Didon shared, and just meeting these uh, amazing women, uh, reconnecting with a college friend, and just to figure out how we can be better and do better as parents. So I'm excited to have this conversation today. Awesome. So I thought to kick it off, maybe we want to talk about community is a big one, obviously, but let's break it down and maybe start talking about how community has helped each of us during COVID and what community has meant, meant to each of us during this period. You know, only in 2020 um, can, you, can you make friends and, and sustain relationships uh, via the internet. You know, um, just, just when we were talking about getting away from social media and, and everything that's digital, we, we really have to lean on it. Um, so not just the opportunity to meet and collaborate and work with Callan, but um, one of the things that that's, was really important for me during this time is that I launched a podcast. And um, not only was it a, an outlet to kind of get some of the frustrations of, of parenthood, but it was an opportunity to talk about fatherhood and to kind of explore different ways to, to look at the whole uh, idea. So it's been really, really good. Um, there's never been a better time to admit that you don't know. And this has been a really, really good opportunity to say, you know, I, I'm lost. I don't know what's going on. And everybody's pretty much in the same boat, or if they're not, they will be soon. So it's been a really good time to kind of start from zero, admit the spaces where we, where we have these deficits so that we can start filling them in a, in a really meaningful way. That's the beauty of life. You know, it throws curveballs. And uh, my community, uh, and particularly my digital community, has, has come in and handy and, and been really, really supportive. I mean, Didon, you just really took exactly how I was feeling and put it into words because I feel that community has completely been redefined since 2020. Uh, before, I think community people thought it was people in your neighborhood or your community at work or just that small little group of friends that you have. But what we realized, even with the uh, four of us today talking, we are now community. We will be forever connected all because of a pandemic, which made us pivot to hope Hopefully become better parents. And I think when you think about community, it also encourages us to look at fellowship, to look at the commonalities that we share, to look at the having the same interests and the same goals. And so for me, that's really what helps us to define community. And you four, three, are now a part of my community. And so I'm really, really grateful for that. And so that was something that I learned too, that community has even been redefined during this time. This year was particularly interesting for me because I moved from Texas to New York City at, right after college in Virginia. I really established myself independently living here, away from my family, the only person to ever move away from home. And this year I had my second child on uh, March 30th, which was right in the middle of the pandemic surge in New York when no one knew what was going on. And so my mother-in-law, in her wisdom, begged us 
to move to my husband's hometown of Buffalo to uh, have the baby there and be there for a little bit of time so that we could, you know, pitch it if we needed to, if anyone got sick, basically. And for someone who kind of grew up thinking that parenting was a solo sport, like maybe two parents did it together, maybe maybe you had grandparents who lived down the street and did it with you, but really it was the family's, you know, job. It was really uncomfortable for me to go into my in-law's home and say, I'm going to be the most vulnerable I've ever been in my entire life. I have no control of what's happening over the way I feel, act, behave, sleep, eat. Like, I'm not going to be on my best behavior like I am every Christmas when I come see you. Um, and everyone's just going to have to deal. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I remember feeling like really uncomfortable with that idea and how much better it was how much better it was to have so many people around me to lend an extra hand for my three-year-old and to, you know, help out when my husband was working and um, to make meals. And just, it, there was this experience that really made me realize that I had so held on to this idea that parenting had to be mine and mine alone. And I could depend on so many other people. And then when you come back to New York City, a lot of my friends and a lot of my, my mom friends, I'll call them, had moved away. But there was this one family that we're extremely close to now that I just, I, I see as my chosen family. I mean, I, uh, I would do anything for this family. And I, I look 10 years in the future and hope their son is just hopping on the subway and coming to our house. And it's the kind of community that I want to build around myself because I didn't really love doing it alone. I have a nine-year-old, a nine-year-old daughter. And so the goal is to keep her occupied. But I'm also um, at that point in her life where, you know, I don't have the same shine that I used to have. So one of the things that I, I did is I reached out to a bunch of women um, in my network, um, different various jobs, uh, very, various levels of education, and just asked, would you take 20 minutes to have a FaceTime conversation with Ella? You guys can talk about whatever, whatever you want. I just want her to get into the, uh, to get comfortable speaking to adults, and, and really, I just needed some time. I hope she's going to interview all of us now. I want to yes. get my chance to talk I want to get my chance, too. I want to be yeah, a right? Ella. The Ella I, I want an Ella conversation. I want an Ella FaceTime. So the first couple conversations, Ella wasn't really sure she wanted me to be in the room, but I, I knew that we were on to something when she told somebody, hold on, and took the, took the laptop into the other room. And so, um, <laughs> Dad, get out of here. Yeah, get out of here, Dad. I, and, and I was happy to leave. <laughs> You're um, infringing on my conversation. <laughs> right, right. And, and, you know, all of my friends gave me notes. They talked about things from bullying to figuring out a fashion sense to books that she was reading to advice on things that they were going through. Um, both ways. Uh, to hearing some of the advice that my daughter gave was, was funny. But, um, and, and at the end, what, what she was able to do is also write thank you notes. And, and so, not only did she have, you know, uh, digital uh, Facebook buddies, but but pen pals as well. So it was a really good experience um, that started out with just me needing a break uh, as a dad, but but ended as something special for both of us. And what I can share to your point, Dina, on something that was very tangible was I got COVID. Um, it wasn't fun, and I, I got COVID uh, earlier this year, and. Not that my husband is inept. He actually cooks more often and, and sometimes cooks better than me. And he's he's a very well-equipped father. But I literally, at a hat's notice, had to leave my house and be quarantined for nine days. So I needed to lean on people, really not just for even my kid, because I knew he was okay, but I needed people who had their own families to then help me uh, that delivered food to me, breakfast, lunch, and dinner three times a day at a hotel because when she were quarantined, you know, there was no room service. They weren't coming to clean my room and do turn down service every day. And so I leaned on, you know, my sorority sisters uh, from Delta Sigma Theta. I, I leaned on my sister mothers from Jack and Jill. Um, and literally these women and several other friends literally bought me food every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day delivered at my door. And so it was so amazing to realize these other women and all of them were parents. 
which is ironic. All of them were parents and they understood and knew what that meant for me to be away from my son. Wow. And what they also did is they were delivering food to my house. And so that allowed my husband and son for a few of those days to kind of just not have to worry about that as they were worried about me. Um, and quite frankly, I was worried about me. You know, the people survived from COVID and we know that there's over 440,000 people that have died from COVID. So um, that's just an example of where people really helped me as I was trying to be a parent, but not physically able to be there. I'm actually just getting over um, a COVID diagnosis as well. And um, I'm not with my daughter's mother. Um, and thankfully, you know, our, our co we have a co-parenting relationship and not just a co-parenting agreement. And how I distinguish the two is a co-parenting agreement is often, you know, it's in, it's in writing. If this, then this, you know, we'll meet here. But when you have a co-parenting relationship, sometimes you have to make a call, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning and says, I just got test results via email saying that I'm positive. And, mm. you know, what, what the schedule looked like for the next week and whose turn it was or whose weekend it was, all that went out the window. And um, my daughter's mom showed up um, about 30 minutes later, picked up Ella and, you know, it was, it was tough. You know, thankfully, I didn't have some of the, the major symptoms that, that, that people have suffered from. But telling my daughter, um, because Ella had spent the night with me that night, and, and telling her that, that I had COVID-19 and that I, could, I couldn't hug her, you know, being, telling her that, seeing the impact on her, because all she knows is what she's seen on the news is that there's this death ticker going. And now her father's telling her this with a mask from her doorway. You know, um, so not being able to console her, but, um, you know, trying to, to make light of the situation, telling her that this gives her time to work on her dance moves, you know, um, <laughs> because there's a challenge brewing when, I, when I'm better. Um, it was tough, but it would have been even tougher if I didn't have a relationship um, with her mother that allowed for both of us to be flexible um, in times of need. Dion, for you, I'm sure having to wake up with a mask and tell your daughter that and then worrying, did I infect her? Does she also have it? It just compounds so deeply when you feel vulnerable as a parent and then you feel like you can't protect your kid, right? And that's right. one of the worst feelings. So the fact that you were able to make a joke about dance moves while delivering that message is Pretty remarkable. Dinon, you mentioned thank you notes, and that always makes me think of my grandmother. And so I grew up, not very common in the US, but I grew up with my grandmother living with us my whole life, my my um, father's mother. So my mom lived with her, her mother-in-law for 30 plus years, which in my book makes my mom a saint because, She wow. is. But yeah, living with your mother-in-law for 30 years, good Lord. Um, but I had a, a small fraction of that this summer. So I remember talking to you, Callan, when you were driving up there and you and I were texting and you were like, I'm in the car, I'm going to my in-laws. Holy God, save me. And then jokes on me because I was like, sucks for you. And then to turn around and three months later for me, I packed up my in-laws, my dog, my 18 month old, my husband, a bunch of bags. And we moved to Maine and we lived with my parents, my two sisters, my brother. So we ended up being in Maine split between like two houses, four senior citizens, including my in-laws, three dogs, five kids under five, two pregnant women, and eight adults uh, who are all working, who are all in dual income homes. So it That's was community, Liz. madness. And that is community. And that was three and a half months of that. Um, and so that was kids everywhere, kids in and out of each other's homes. And I grew up in a multi-generational home, but this took that to steroids. And so it's, you know, community is, is sometimes blending families too. And it, it, my parents are from Maine. My husband's parents are from Argentina. My husband and I live in Miami, which is as much of a midpoint between Maine and Argentina as one gets. And so bringing, you know, cultures together, communities together was the, certainly most people don't expect their in-laws and their parents to live together for three and a half months. So that, you know, was an interesting COVID experience, but certainly was community for sure. You made it. We made it. When you were talking right now about talking to Ella and it, it made me start thinking about culture which is one of our other C's. So I think the culture around working parents, the words we use, to your point, Didon, talking about Meaty's dad and what's changed for dads, what societal norms have changed or haven't changed, and what you guys think kind of the culture around working parents, the way that society perceives them, supports them, doesn't support them. How do you think that may or may not have been impacted and changed through COVID? You know, I think there are a lot of I think there are a lot of single mothers who are married 
you know, um, while that's there may really be... Wow, you need to say um, that again, Diran. That's a whole yeah. thing that you just said. It, it's true. You know, while a mother and father may live under the same roof, um, mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the child-rearing responsibilities are, are, aren't equity dis equally distributed. And that may be fine, depending on whatever the circumstances are. But I, I think coronavirus... And, and the pandemic has, has caused us to, to kind of circle the horses a little bit and kind of redefine, okay, what are we going to do? I, I think that, that this has really been a good opportunity to, to shake up some of those, in some cases, antiquated notions and to, and to look at them with fresh eyes. I agree with that, Didan, because you talk about culture being kind of sometimes the norms, what we normally do for each other, um, what society says is to be acceptable. And I think to your point, very well taken and i think everybody no person has not been untouched by COVID, right so that's the that's if you will um trying to find the beauty in it that it kind of created a level set and it allowed all of us to really have a greater appreciation for each other collectively individually within our society within our community within our workforces where people had to be flexible and and break the stereotypes of what culture normally said that the mother always does this or father does this. And I think we needed community to help us redefine that. We needed our cultures to be shaken up, as you said. And for me, like I said, you know, the culture in my household made a big shift because I wasn't here, um, because I was a nurse. I was the frontline worker. I was that healthcare hero to others. But then now I'm reflecting as a mother, well, is that what impact does, did that have? for those several months or even now, quite frankly, of uh, where I was kind of away. And even having and speaking it verbally to you guys right now really makes me wanna go and hug my son and say, how did you feel when mom was gone? Are you okay? Like, you know, what were your thoughts when I was going into the hospital every day? And I did do quick touch bases with him. And now I, I'm actually, um, like I'm trying not to tear up because I realized that I really do a good job of making sure he was okay because I was afraid and I was trying to put on a good face and be chipper and excited when quite frankly, he's 14 years old. You know, he's a little older than Ella and you know, Liz and Cal and you guys have much younger uh, kids and babies and toddlers and so, but my kid is 14. So he's very um, astute, he can read, he understands what's happening, he's watching the news, he's able to interpret the political aspect of things. He's able to interpret, as you said, uh, Liz, this death ticker, and mom is still going into this place, uh, fighting this um, unknown virus, if you will. And I wonder how that impacted him. So even as I'm talking to you guys today, it's really making me feel I need to go back and really do a double check on him and make sure he was okay. And also with my husband and actually thank him for stepping up, not that he hasn't and not that I need to thank him, right? Because parents do what parents are supposed to do. Our kids didn't ask to be here. And so I think it's just important that um, I circle back with that. So I'm, I'm so glad we're having this conversation today. Needy, uh, you said a few things, both of you said a few things that really resonated for me. And the first is my husband said to me tonight, um, he said, as I was unloading the dishwasher for the fifth time today, thinking how annoying it is, I have all these glasses to unload. I realized that you do this all the time with laundry because our daughter is particularly obsessed with one dress that she, she must wear to school every day. So she basically has a uniform, but she only has one of them. And he was like, and I just want to let you know that I really appreciate you doing all of the laundry and everything you do for our family. Mm. And it just, it mattered, right? It just kind of set mm -hmm. this tone. And to your point, Meaty, about culture, I tell this to leaders and managers that I work with all the time. Culture happens whether you mean for it to or not. Wow. Like, it is happening. And so the question becomes, are you being intentional about it? And what do you want it to be? And I see the biggest thing that gets parents in particular in trouble is making assumptions. It's making assumptions that because I was the mom for the first six months of my first daughter's life who stayed home for my leave, that all of a sudden I know everything about her and that I'm gonna continue to know everything about her and everything that she needs. And for us, you know, we really didn't have a come to about that until she was about 18 months old. But I was working a full time job and growing a business and and trying to, to do all of these things. And I just realized there needed to be this reset, this cultural and assumption based reset in my home or else I wasn't going to stop working. I'll tell you that. But there was going to be a lot of resentment that was going to be underneath all of that conversation. Um, 
And so for me, it's often about thinking through checking in on where I am right now and where I like where my husband is and where where my work is and all of that and saying what needs to be true for us because I don't think it can always be even and I'm not sure that's necessarily the goal for people but it's a question of how is it more fair and fair can take on a bunch of different meanings. Of course culture in the home, resentment in the home, those are big issues. Those are things that a lot of people spend a lot of time talking about in their couples and trying to figure out in across co-parenting relationships. It's also something that comes into the workplace. And so you see resentment among teams where there's parents and there aren't parents. You see cultures that are better and cultures that are worse. I was talking to a company today and I'd be curious to get all of your feedback for a company that we partner with. And they were talking about how their managers keep telling the parents that it's okay for their kids to be on Zoom. And the managers in the C-suite keep having their kids on Zoom to show it. And yet the parents don't seem to be okay with their kids on Zoom. And one of the things I stopped and said to them was, well, but maybe it's not that the parents aren't okay with it. I know for myself, I have a two month old and an 18 month old. If my kids are on Zoom, then I am only 50% in that meeting. And that's the stress. It's not that I don't think my kid can be on Zoom. It's that I have an internal warfare of, if my kid is on Zoom, then, I'm, then I might be nursing, I might be breastfeeding, I might be, my, my 18 month old broke his foot last month playing on the floor while I was on a call and he was just playing on the floor. So they might be hurting themselves, like anything can be happening. And so as we look into this future of work and whether we're remote or hybrid or work from home, and I think different companies will be different ways, but figuring out how people bring them whole selves to work, how you bring that, how you mesh that, it's gonna be a really big challenge. And I, you know, the future is certainly talent, right? It's people. So how you attract and retain talent is going to be important and how you feel comfortable in your workplace is going to be critical. And so I don't know how any of you may have shifted how you think about combining those two and what that means for you right now and, and going forward. So Liz, I'll just quickly share as a person who did not work from home, um, and I'm still not working from home, is that- And you won't. Person, <laughs> and I won't be working from home, right? Because yeah. the patients are here. I think it's important for anyone that is in the workforce and those of us that are leaders in the workforce to really just have a very transparent conversation with your employees and ask them, how can I support you versus saying, oh, just go on Zoom. It's okay if your kids are on Zoom. Everybody's not going to want that. And I agree with you 100%. My son is 14. And even though he doesn't need me to feed him or to go get something from the refrigerator, if he's walking by, if he's talking, if he's getting something out of the kitchen, it's so distracting. And I think you know, maybe sometimes it can even be about what are the timings of the meetings? You know, uh, how else can we do this where, you know, does it have to be on Zoom or is it, let's send the presentation, read it, and then send me back your comments, whatever it is. For me in nursing, and as a nurse, my support for my team has been, hey, you might need to go to night shift for the next few weeks and switch from day shifts because your husband is doing ABC, so you need to thereby be at home during the day so your husband, who's another essential worker, can both work it out. And so for me, I've done that. Um, making sure where people said, hey, I can't get here right at seven. That's the, the bewitching hour in the hospital, you know, between seven and 7.30 is when the shift exchange takes place. And saying to that coworker, um, listen, it's okay if you get here at 7.15 or 7.30 and don't worry about, we're not gonna mark you late, it's okay because you have to go drop your kid off at you know your relative's house before you come in because school is closed and you're dealing with virtual learning. So I think the key is for workforces to uh, work people in the workplace rather, to make sure that they're just really asking their employees because it looks different. But giving them that option I think is great. A hybrid situation is great. For those of us that are frontline workers, I think giving grace as it relates to time and attendance um, is definitely very, key and making sure that we're being uh, mindful of where people really need that break in time away. There's a subtle but important distinction. You know, when they say it's okay for your kid to be on Zoom, are they giving permission to parent or are they giving encouragement to keep working? You know, okay, your kid's in the background with no pants on. Don't worry, keep working. This, the meeting is fine. Don't worry about the kid. Great point. Or are you saying, hey, I see you have a kid that you need to put some pants on. You know, um, <laughs> I'm a mediator. That's one, one of the things that I do. And I mediate cases of child abuse and neglect. And that's not something, that's not energy that I want to expose my daughter to. Mm. Um, and, and it's not just I want her not to overhear the conversation. But to be in a place where for several hours you're, you're mediating a case where you're hearing some of these things that happen, 
that that's personal energy that, you know, if I was taking the train home, I could decompress. Or if I was driving home, I'd go the long way so that I could make sure that I could show up for my daughter hmm. as opposed to, okay, let me turn off my camera, transition to making lunch. Such a great point. It's fine. And I'm thankful to have the opportunity to work at home and the opportunity to continue to make money and take care of my family while at the kitchen table. But it's also important that I that I create barriers that protect my daughter from my work, you know, because because this is her home and she deserves to be able to, you know, a nine year old probably shouldn't walk around with no pants on, but she deserves <laughs> to be able to be herself in her home um, because this is her space, too. Great, great point, point. Dina, and I appreciate that. And how many times, um, you know, Cal and Liz, have you all heard people that you are working with and helping to manage during the scenario where people actually feel like they're working more now that they're working Mm -hmm. virtual than they did when they actually went into the workplace because you can't shut it down. And because you do have that person, oh, it's okay, just get it to me by eight o'clock tonight. Like, whereas if you were in the workplace, you know, when you're gone, you're gone. So, you know, I like what you said, Dina, about are they giving me permission to parent, you know? No, it's a, it's a great point. And does flexible just become another word for burnout? Does flexible mean, wow, it's cool. You can work 24 seven, you know, we're being flexible, but we expect you to still get everything done at the same amount of time on the same KPIs and you can run yourself into the ground, but we're flexible. And I think that's where, you know, that can be a coverall that it, it, like any tool, right? If you don't teach people how to use them, they're either not going to use it or they're going to hurt themselves. And I think we're getting to that point with flexible where people are not, it's become this term and nobody's teaching people how to use it. And so to your point, Didon, that subtlety and messaging and that communication is not coming through and it's really dangerous. And, and as a result, we're seeing people leave the workforce and those people are women and their moms. I don't know if you all saw the report that comes out every summer or fall, but leanin.org and McKinsey do a women in the workplace study every single year. Mm-hmm. And this year it was, I very rarely cry at work, even though I do very human-centric work and I'm very empathetic, but I actually closed the report and cried because what I took away from it first was that we have gone so far away from a culture where humans, like where we understand that humans work in the workplace and we've kind of replaced it with this idea that we're all kind of machines that we can just constantly be producing and going as long as we're just really efficient or we eat the right combinations of foods or whatever it is. Like we play this game with ourselves. And one of the things in this study was that at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of senior level language around it's okay to do what you need to do. It's okay to take the time you need to take in, in a lot of companies, but not most. Mm. And yet only 8% of managers were trained in how to make that happen and given the permission to change their goals. So here we are to Liz's point with the same goals, but significantly less time, focus, energy, ability to do it in the middle of a national international crisis. That's, that's causing all of us to have a lot of feelings before we can even show up to the computer um, and to consider a lot of other things around our safety and security that are baseline for us to be able to show up and do good work. And when I think about why that is, I think it comes down to fear. It's a fear of, well, I don't know what else to do. I don't know how else to help. I don't know how to work differently. And so maybe I can just tinker on the margins and and make it work better. I don't think it comes from a place of not wanting to do well, but it's really just a lack of knowledge. And then for some reason, this inability to say, "Um, hi, can I get some help here? I don't, I don't know how to manage this. This is really hard. Callan, you know, you raised the point about burnout. And, and Liz, you talked about the impact on the workforce and, and, and how it's um, heavily impacting working moms. And, and Media, you talked about the long-term uh, effect of what's going on right now. I wonder um, what care has looked like for us all um, in the last year. And if there's anything um, of note that you wanted to talk about as it relates to care, be it self-care or family care, I have never in my life cared more about my basics. Like, I finally, at this stage in my life, see exercise as something that is helpful. Mm. That is not, it's not in service of anything else except my mental and You're like, it's not optional. And emotional. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, girls got to move. I'm going to move every day. That's what I'm going to do. Um, 
water. Like it's so, my mom, my mom raised me to do this, but like all children, you know, you go out and come back in. Um, but the, the basics of water and nutritious food, trying to get sleep, even though sleeping right now can be really hard for people. And also for Liz and me, you know, sleep training and all that stuff my like connection practice, whether that's a spiritual practice or connecting with people I love um, and, and really trying to process stress because stress is what causes burnout and just trying to process the stress before it turns into that burnout has been really personally important for me. And I think it's somewhat aggravating when I tell people, you know, particularly folks that I coach, um, I really need you to focus on that first. I need you to take 30 minutes a day for yourself when they have too much to do anyway. Uh, but it's something that I really focus in on because without that, without that foundation, I'm not sure how else you can build on that. You know, it's that common metaphor of when you're pl flying in a plane, you need to put your oxygen mask on first before you assist a child. Um, and for me, this has just been a moment of real understanding how important it is to do that first. Respect everything you're saying, Callan, and I am the person who is like, yes, and I tell people to do that, and then I don't do it. I'm super hypocritical like that. I'm like, but uh, but I'm strong <laughs> enough to not work out, to not eat healthy, to not sleep, to do that. You guys should do that. I'm going to sleep three hours, and I'll be fine. I'm very much that person, which is not great. Um, and uh, consequently, I'm also somebody who believes I can do a lot of things alone. And I would say the biggest shift for me in pandemic is the shift from thinking I can do it alone to leaning really heavily on my husband during a lot of this to leaning really heavily on friends and family. My sister has been here for the last six weeks, which has been incredible for me because I am somebody who lives the far, my family is very close. Everybody lives in New England. I live the farthest away. I didn't realize how much that impacted me until this when I, you know, everybody else was an hour and a half from each other and I was many states away and that was so hard. And still my parents haven't met my newborn and that crushes me to the point of almost crying now because I talk to my parents on the phone every single day and so to have an eight week old baby that they haven't met is like just earth shatteringly hard for me and so I think what I I'm very much I lived all over the world I lived in in Istanbul and Mexico and in India by myself and so I really think I can do a lot of things myself until the pandemic and kids and pregnancy and everything in the pandemic and realize how critical that family and to your point chosen family Callan two of our best friends moved to Miami during the pandemic and that has been a true game changer for us but very much back into that community and realizing how how much I cannot do alone one of the things that I've realized um, during this pandemic with a 14 year old who now is using elect an, an only child might I add whose only connection with his friends and outside world um, are cell phones and mm. his computer. And I literally had to say, God, like literally, literally pray. God, um, I raised my kid to be the best possible kid to make the best decisions. And I've always said to him, and this is a, a quote that he will say that mommy always taught him, that good decisions have good outcomes bad decisions have bad consequences. And so he knows, you know, cause my fear was he's in this room, you guys, for eight, nine hours a day. I'm at the hospital for 10, 11, 12 hours. Dad's downstairs working for eight hours and he's literally on a device where he is connected to the randomness of the world, the ills of the world, all the things that we know. And I'm like, oh my God, please make sure he does not click on some crazy site. And so for me, the biggest pivot that I had to make as a parent is really trust myself and trust a community um, that he's been around pre-COVID. Um, and now that we are in COVID actively still continuing um, during this pandemic is really just having faith that I've done the best that I can um, and know that he will fall and I'm going to be there for him. I was very much so the helicopter mom with the checklist. Okay, you got to do this. You have to get in this organization to get your community service hours. You have to do this so you can get into this high school. You have to do this so you can get on this lacrosse team. You have to do this because you're a young black man. And so last year, it was also the, the ills of a, a twin pandemic, quite frankly, was the pandemic of the actual COVID, but then the social unrest and uneasiness of, of a young um, you know, man, George Floyd, everybody watched eight minutes and 46 seconds of that with his knee on his neck. So regardless of your walk of life, regardless of your outcome, people saw someone murdered, right? And so to sit there with my son to then realize, wow, and then have to navigate that waters, 
but just in the house with mom and dad, he can't see his friends, can't go hang out, can't have any outlet for his own fears and frustrations. So I really had to learn to just love and let go. Mm. Scary, meaty. How has my perspective changed? So I'm 44 years old. And for the last 20 years, I've been trying to lose 30 pounds. And one of the, the lies that I told myself, and I recognize it as a lie now, is that I didn't have time to work out. And um, I didn't start 2020 with the goal of losing X amount of weight. I wanted to be healthier. Um, but during the pandemic, I just started walking more. I mentioned me and Ella got out more. We, you know, did what we could. We live in a two-bedroom apartment. And so as much out outside time that we could spend, the better. And by the end of the year, I'd lost 50 pounds. And it, it wasn't an accident by, by the end of the year. By the end of the year, um, you know, I, I began working out regularly. I began eating more healthily, you know, um, and incorporated Ella into that process. You know, what vegetable are we going to focus on this week? You know, it was broccoli a lot of weeks. But um, <laughs> get, getting her to take agency over, hey, I've never had a star fruit or I've never had this type of apple. Even if that type of apple was three times the price of a regular Gala apple or a Granny Smith. But, you know, exploring different healthy options and, you know, liking some, not liking others, but but it being okay um, was really, really a, a good experience. Um, I can't say that my, my experience with COVID would have been different if I had 50 more pounds on me, but it's not something that I was that I want to gamble. And, and it's certainly not it's not a state that I want to go back to. You know, when, when I think about how much weight I lost, it's about the same weight as my nine-year-old daughter, you know? Wow. Um, and, and so that just put it in perspective for me. And so if the goal is to invest in her and to pour into her, well, the, the simple logic is the longer that I'm around to do that, the, the more um, I can invest. And, and while I can't guarantee anything, um, I, I can do things that, that make it a, that make a better shot on my part. So that's one of the ways that my perspective has changed and, and I'm not, I'm committed to, to not giving these gains back. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. That's amazing. I think my two perspective shifts, I think for me, the first is I became a mom at the same time that I started my own business. Wow. Yeah. Four years ago. It was really, it was really transformational actually as an experience. And up until then, I had been a career-driven, hard-charging, going to be at the office at 7 a.m. and leave at 9 p.m. kind of person. Um, a lot of narrative in my head, to your point, Needy, from growing up, that the more you do, the more you get, and the more you get, the more you're worth, and um, that you have a lot of control over your outcomes. And as I started this business and I was growing this human, I had this realization one day that uh, most of the good things that have happened in my life are things that happened without me trying to control them. Like, I just happened to meet my husband. Um, wow. I, and we have an amazing, beautiful relationship that I treasure. I, um, this baby, like I did a lot. I had a lot of responsibility for this kid growing, but it's not like I told myself to take every breath or to pump every heartbeat or to create little fingernails. And then something miraculous came out of that, right? And that was a perspective shift as a parent, was that there are a lot of really, really great things that come that you, you may have responsibility for, but you don't have a lot of control over. And then the pandemic hits. And from a business perspective, I remember saying back in April, well, I guess my strategic plan is just, a suggestion to the universe like at this point like we've got to we got to fit it like and and we got to I, I had to just kind of trust that um the good things were going to come out of of something new and something different but the second perspective shift i'll share is just that i've been thinking a lot recently about how i really don't want to go back to a lot of the ways of operating um personally or um, in the world that we had before this um, I remember a particular fever pitch back in February of last year where it just felt like there was so much coming at me and so much going on and all this information. And it just felt really, really fast. 
And then there was this kind of halt and this stop. And we kind of saw a lot of things break in that process. And I would love to use this opportunity as that launching point to say, okay, like what works and what doesn't? And what are we going to do in this moment where we, we could have a blank slate and do better and try better and be better? Because we've seen that what we've inherited and what we've allowed to kind of keep happening just doesn't work. Um, and I have hope on some days that's going to happen because there's lots of brilliant, innovative people who are doing it um, and who are talking about it. But then on other days, I kind of hear this like, I can't wait to get back to normal, um, even though that normal wasn't working for people. Given what you just said, Callan, one of the questions that I wonder about is that as we have this conversation and we think about parenting, particularly through the lenses of culture, community, and companies, um, what does it mean moving forward to be better? When I started my company three and a half years ago, I was terrified to have a kid in corporate America because I knew the stats. I knew the gender gap. I knew the wage gap. I knew the 43% of women who left. I looked around my company. I didn't know where I was currently working in finance. I didn't know who the parents were. I didn't know who they were because nobody was talking about being a parent. There were no visible moms ahead of me. So it was 2018 and I was terrified to get pregnant, which is pretty insane if you if you think about that. And so I think those systems were failing. They already were so weak. And what happened is we just cut out every last strip, right? We were hanging on by a thread and that has been decimated in this pandemic. And when I say we, I mean working parents at large. Working parents are actually what connects across a workforce. You find them at every level of seniority. You find them across every minority group. And so if that is what connects across your workforce, then that really needs to be core to a much more holistic and integrated approach. And so it gets into your points on, on managers, Callan, to Meaty, to your point, it gets into communication, listening, changing norms. And so I, I think that what it means to be better is to create a culture that cares. And I think what that means is to lead with empathy, with understanding, with facilitating belonging and making a place where people feel included. And until we can have that sharing, until we can have that understanding, you are gonna have the resentment that we talked about, whether it's between spouses, whether it's between coworkers, whether it's between managers and different levels. And so I think to be better, the leaders, if, if tech, and you talked about your son on devices, if tech is what led the last 10 years, I think what leads the next 10 years is people, and that's a war on talent. And the way to attract and retain that talent and the way to build a stronger community and society out of it is by creating these open conversations. I love that we have different ages, different races, different genders on here. It can't keep happening that we talk about working parents in silos as women in small groups. It has to be an open conversation and it has to be a holistic integrated approach. And so being better is allowing for that conversation and it's creating a sense of belonging and inclusion. Everything you said, Liz, is amazing. And it's to practice grace and empathy, having grace, having empathy and listening, um, which is exactly what you just said. Um, I, I couldn't add anything more to what you said. And that's what I want to do so I can be be a better parent and also be a better manager and leader of people who are parents. When I was 20 something years old in that hard charging career I was talking about, and I had no context for being a working parent, I managed a colleague who child was born at 29 weeks gestation, so very premature. And in Washington, D.C., where he and his wife lived in Brooklyn, they were at their baby shower. And I totally screwed it up. I contributed to a really tough environment for him, and he resigned. And I remember that failure, and I, I remember um, feeling personally responsible to some extent for that happening. Then fast forward many years later when I had my first child and I really understood the depth of what he was going through and what the conversation must have been like with his wife when she's sitting in the hospital with a premature child and he's calling her going back and forth between DC and Brooklyn and he says, I gotta quit this thing. And, and the personal responsibility I had as a manager on his life. And all of a sudden I started looking at all the research recently, y'all. And I realized if you put all the research together, it is quite possible that a manager is as important to your health and happiness and success and satisfaction as the people you marry. Like they are easily in the top five people who influence wow. your day to day feelings, right? And you get goosebumps thinking about it because you're like, oh my gosh, 
I didn't know what I was doing. Mm. I got all my advice from mentors who, who didn't know the situation and managed a style that was decades old. So for me, doing better is recognizing just our interconnectedness recognizing especially leaders recognizing their influence and their their power and their responsibility but in a way where they really have a choice in what they create and for us as individuals i often tell people to just think on it because it's so big and it feels so hard to deal with to just think about it on three levels what are you going to do for yourself what are you going to do in your relationships and in your community and what are you going to do in your system for yourself, do you need to have that conversation with your partner about the dishes? Do you need to say thank you like my gorgeous husband did for emptying the dishwasher, laundry, whatever? You know, for your community, do you need to call in some friends who are family? Do you need to stop doing everything on your own? Um, you know, in, in your systems, in your companies, and in your politics, we haven't even gotten into policy and we probably don't want to because it's really hard. <laughs> but, you know, how are you going to vote? Do you know who supports child care and paid leave and all of these things? Like, and also in your systems of your companies, how do you want to affect change and, and bring in change because you do have power in that? You know, it took a pandemic stripping away all of these layers of protection for us to admit in some cases that we were lost um, mm -hmm. when we may have been lost prior to the pandemic. Wow. And, and so being better to me is being brave enough to be vulnerable and to say, I need help in, in my community or to, you know, rethink the way I'm, I'm, I'm parenting and saying, hey, you know, this is how I learned it or this is how it's always been in my mind, but it's not really working out how I envisioned. How can we do it differently? You know, and that might, be, that might include a conversation with the actual child I'm trying to parent, <laughs> you know, um, in addition to, to her mother. And at work, it, it's being able to ask real questions. And, and feeling comfortable and supported and asking for support. You know, I, and, and when we look for jobs, being able to ask questions that we really want to know the answer to that will reflect our values, you know, because as, as it's been pointed out and expounded upon, you know, the relationship with your supervisor will be incredibly meaningful to your future. So um, being better just means to me being vulnerable and, and leaning in to having real conversations. Um, that will ultimately be um, to my best interest and to my family's best interest.